I'm delighted that you've come to listen to us talking on the event of the centenary of suffragette uh, interventions to consider the way in which design was a vital part of that activism. I have with me here four uh, members of the MST in the History of Design, two alumni and two current students who are going to share their research with us today. What I found so exciting about embarking on planning this Masters was to think about the ways in which the material world around us, public space, are a vital part of how we define ourselves politically, uh, personally, and globally. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is how the material culture of dress, of ordinary objects such as teacups or handkerchiefs, badges that one wears on a lapel, as well as jewellery, were a vital element of the ways in which women fought for the right to be part of legislation, of public life, of suffrage. So we're going to look at five different case studies, but before we do, I'll just quickly introduce my colleagues here. Dee is part of the current cohort. She will be looking at the role of ceramics in the promulgation of the cause. Vega is an alumna who's going to talk about the role of badges. Katie will look at the role of handmade uh, embroidery in the prison experience of suffragettes. And then we have Susan talking us through the role of jewellery and medals in the articulation of that cause and honouring the role that women played in garnering the vote. But before we do, I draw your attention to what we have on the table here, which is just a silk scarf. This is a very ordinary, everyday object in many ways, but is part of a whole culture of dress and spectacle, which was at the heart of how suffragists and suffragettes, women who fought for the right for legislative change to allow them the vote, as well as women who took up direct action to secure that vote through whatever means at their disposal, often used ordinary objects to persuade and provoke a British public into giving them the right to vote, to participate in public life in a very different way. Now, a lot of what the objects that we're going to look at today explore are the ways in which the ordinary and the spectacular coalesce in an object like a scarf. Colours, the way in which one carries oneself, these were all part of the ways in which women tried to establish a much more complex sense of their gender and their right to work, to vote, to participate in British public life. So I just wanted to briefly consider sort of two main kinds of spectacle. The rally or the public speech that was often conducted in key politically engaged areas like Trafalgar Square or in public spaces like train stations in the United States, but also the world of theatre. I think we often focus particularly on figures like the Pankhursts. These very elite and articulate women are often members of the aristocracy who were the public face of the suffragette cause. But there are a whole array of different women who were involved in smaller unions, the Actresses Franchise League, uh, the, the National Women's Party in the United States, who were equally vital in transforming that cause, as well as the contribution of many largely forgotten working class women who were part of the Women Political and Social Union. So at a rally, very often the wearing of a scarf such as this one was a way of demonstrating a, a commitment to the cause whilst also preserving a sense of a very distinctive sense of femininity. A lot of how the plea for suffragist rights to the vote were denigrated in earlier periods after the interventions of the 1860s attempting to open up the suffrage debate in Parliament. A lot of that positioned women wanting the vote as female figures who 
were neglected in public life. They were not mothers. They were not successful participants in the roles of femininity and were often caricatured in the popular press, particularly in the Daily Mail, as being uncouth, unfashionable, unfeminine. Now, an important dimension of the suffragette intervention was to use simple but elegant dress as a way of articulating a distinctive femininity, not corseted and constrained in the way that high fashion had dictated in the Victorian period, but equally not perhaps the vocabulary of the blue stocking that was so much of how figures like Barbara Bodichon and Cambridge were denigrated uh, for their efforts to secure university education for women. So what's fascinating to me is the variety of forms of public dress and accessory that women deployed to articulate this different kind of femininity that often involved the wearing of very plain white clothing, but with a so-called statement hat, often with floral motifs. Now, if you saw 40,000 women marching as were involved in the coronation procession of 1911, all wearing white dresses, but wearing subtly different colored scarves or insignia, uh, such as the brooch that Feig is going to talk about, you have a wonderful sense of individuality and collectivity, a commitment to a cause that allows for your personal identity. If you're an artist, you would wear blue and silver. If you're an actress, you'd wear pink, green and white. If you're part of the WSPU, you would then wear uh, purple, green and white. And I think that sense of using colours, of using dress, as well as comportment, was a lot of the way in which the, go the vote was secured. Now this public spectacle of pageantry wasn't just about elegance. A lot of how American women fighting for the vote articulated the intensity of their commitment was to actually wear the workhouse clothes that they had been forced to carry and adopt when imprisoned for their silent sentinel protest outside the White House in 1917. This became a kind of badge of honour. They were ugly, they were calico, they were dehumanising, but the important political point was that it made them into criminals rather than political dissenters. And that's a key activist point. If one was being imprisoned, for fighting for the right to vote, it's a very different way of being punished to be placed among criminality rather than being held as a political prisoner. And this is a feature that I think will come up in Katie's intervention as well as Susan's. I'm particularly interested in theatre design and there's a wonderful actress who was part of a set of Shakespeare productions at the Savoy Theatre between 1911 and 1914. Lila McCarthy was part of the Actresses Franchise League, which was a group of London actresses, theatrical managers, and indeed uh, collaborations between department stores and the suffragette press, who used new plays such as Votes for Women at the Royal Court in 1906, which replicates a suffragette rally with 40 actresses on the stage all at once to bring that cause into the public eye. But also the positioning of key Shakespeare performances as part of a way of rethinking Shakespeare's heroines as exemplars of different models of femininity. One of the most uh, impactful of these performances was a Winter's Tale production in 1911. Bear in mind that on the 1st of March in 1911, women throughout London positioned themselves in front of shop windows with small toffee hammers, such as the one that you see on Katie's lapel there. It was a larger object. This is more of a, a jewellery formulation of it. And simultaneously, in a synchronised direct action, smashed those glass windows. This is a kind of political performance forcing provocation 
to persuade a public to give political rights to women. Actresses often used theatrical performance and indeed their costuming and staging as a slightly more subtle but nonetheless direct way of engaging a wider public in the cause and the debate. So Lila McCarthy, along with Ellen Terry, Edie Craig, a whole set of women who are working in a, a sort of triangle of theatres, the Little Theatre, the Kingsway, as well as the Savoy, which bear in mind are all near the Strand, which is where the main head office of the Women's Social and Political Union was housed, later at Lincoln's Inn's Field, which is only a, a stone's throw away, forgive the pun. Uh, this was all a central geography of suffragette agency. But in choosing to perform The Winter's Tale, you have three visions of femininity. Hermione, who is the stoical matron, Perdita, who is the flighty young ingenue, but vitally Paulina. And in the suffragette reviews of that production, Paulina is singled out as the heroine of The Winter's Tale, as a proto-suffragette. She speaks truth to power, she demands a better world than Hermione or Perdita has experienced. Now, Lila McCarthy is part of a set of actresses, as I say, who use these productions both through their characterization, but also in Twelfth Night through the subtle staging of performance to signal the suffragette cause. Importantly, the garden in Twelfth Night, and indeed Viola, who then becomes the young boy Cesario, are dressed in the suffragette colours, in green, in white, in violet, give women the vote. So that sense of using the performance of self on stage or in pageantry or in procession is a vital way in which material culture expressed the suffragette cause. And with that introduction in mind, I'm delighted to have colleagues from the MST programme present their research as current students and all Kellogg uh, members of college. So firstly, we're going to start with Dee talking about the ways in which uh, a ceramic tea set is part of this process of persuasion. So I'm talking about an apparently very ordinary object, a teacup and saucer. The teacup and saucer is made of bone china and was made by Williamson and Sons at the Bridge Works in Stoke-on-Trent. What makes this teacup and saucer absolutely remarkable is the emblem that's transferred onto the teacup and the saucer. The emblem is the emblem of the Women's Social and Political Union, and it was designed by Sylvia Pankhurst. Sylvia Pankhurst, who lived from 1882 to 1960, was a remarkable designer. She'd studied art at the Royal College of Art and was really the design genius behind the whole Women's Social and Political Union cause. The teacup and saucer was specifically ordered for a refreshment room, a refreshment room that was going to be part of the Prince's Skating Rink exhibition that the WSPU were holding in May 1909. The design for the whole exhibition was arrived at by Sylvia Pankhurst and a group of people who were assisting her. And they produced wonderful banners um, in white, purple and green to, to adorn the hall. And the hall also was full of women, it was going to be full of women from the um, WSPU who were wearing the white dresses um, and were looking very feminine. And they were going to be selling handicrafts and similar things that they'd made. And the idea was to attract women who weren't part of the movement into the hall so that they could see the women who were members of the WSPU, could talk to them, and who could learn, they could learn about votes for women and the importance of that. I'd like to talk a bit about the emblem itself. Um, the colours of the emblem, green, purple and white, um, represent, green represents hope, purple represents loyalty, and white represents purity. So these were very important colours and projected a very important feeling for, for the WSPU. So 
Sylvia Pankhurst was a brilliant designer. Um, she absolutely um, took the most important um, idea of femininity from the Edwardian era and used it within the emblem. You'll see in the center of the emblem there's an angel and the angel is dressed in white and she's standing on tiptoe. She's a very feminine angel. She's wearing a very modern dress too. Her, her ankles are showing. The length of the skirt is, is what um, fashionable women were wearing at that point in time. She looks very elegant and she's blowing very gently on, on a beautiful thin trumpet. It's not a sort of loud, raucous trumpet. It's just a very sort of pleasant, elegant looking trumpet. And behind her, in her right hand, she's holding a banner, a very thin banner, which has the word freedom written on it. So this, this image conveys a strong image of the ideal Edwardian woman. This idea of the woman as an angel was promoted by a poem by Patmore called The Angel of the Hearth. So the woman was evidently at the core of the home in Edwardian society. Um, she was feminine, she was delicate, she was someone to be treasured within the household. But we also know that angels are not totally delicate, they're also avenging angels. Um, and it's no sort of uh, surprise to find that the patron saint of the WSPU is Joan of Arc, uh, a woman who um, was not altogether peaceful when she was feeling angry. So there is this sort of undertone of strength alongside the angel. Surrounding the angel, um, there's a circle, a green circle, and within this circle, there, is, um, there are two chains on either side of the angel. Um, it's thought that these chains might well represent imprisonment, but it's also possible that they represent the economic exploitation of women. In the years before this 1909 exhibition, Sylvia Pankhurst had travelled around the country looking at women's work, and in particular looking at, at the sort of work that, that women who, who didn't have many resources were subjected to. She was particularly appalled by the situation in a chain-making factory at Cranley Heath in Staffordshire, where women were made to make heavy chains in awful circumstances, and they were paid four to five shillings a week. And this very much um, stuck in her mind. So the chains may well represent economic exploitation as well as imprisonment. Also on this outer circle, there, there's a rose, a thistle and a shamrock, which indicates the unity of, of the whole of the United Kingdom uh, associated with this cause. The idea for the angel um, probably comes from Walter Crane. Walter Crane, um, a famous designer and artist, um, had used the angel motif, and in particular the motif of an angel of freedom, um, in service of the socialist um, cause in the latter part of the 19th century. And it's thought that Sylvia Pankhurst got this idea from him. She certainly knew Crane, and so was probably influenced by him too. So here we have a teacup and saucer with this emblem of Edwardian femininity on it, but also undertow of strength as well. And women would come to the refreshment room and they would have the quintessentially British afternoon tea, drinking out of these teacups. And so they were literally refreshed, but perhaps they were also politically refreshed. They could see that they could be the ideal Edwardian woman, but they could also want the vote. I think what's wonderful about how these introduced us to these elegant objects that persuade and engage. And I think one of the exciting parts of recent scholarship around suffragette interventions is looking at the enormously wider spectrum of society that were involved in the suffragette cause. You had gentlemen actors, as well as key political male figures, but also vitally importantly, working class women who were risking everything by getting involved. Often employment, often the care and security of their futures. 
And I think one of the exciting connections between looking at this elegant tea service, inviting potential middle class and elite participants to engage, is that there are also ways in which the higher echelons, the powerful echelons of society, as well as the most oppressed, cross boundaries in important ways. Now that's not just Lady Lytton dressing up as a charwoman and cutting her hair to sneak out of the back of meetings so she wouldn't be arrested, but it's also that working class women also felt empowered to wear the kind of regalia that these elite figures have. So I'm delighted that Vaib is going to talk to us about those. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, a tin badge issued by the WSPU. Um, and going on a quote, they said, um, such a little thing everyone can do, how the WSPU used the button badge. Um, so the, the button badge I'm specifically talking about is one of their earliest ones, um, which uh, features a circle on the outside um, and a circle on the inside, and it reads votes for women. It's considered probably one of the earliest badges, if not the first, uh, although it's been somewhat hard to date. Um, the exact date of issue is unclear, but with um, it's probably around 1908. Um, the Museum of London, who um, hold um, a, one of these brooches, um, state it as 1908 to possibly 1910, which might have been the years of production. Um, the designer of the brooch, unlike um, many other brooches that they, pre they um, subsequently produced, is unclear. Um, unlike a later brooch produced by Sylvia Pankhurst, this one um, is unknown. Um, as many of the WSPU members were very artistic, always creating um, banners and posters, um, various other um, merchandise and promotional items, it's likely that one of them produced the tin badge for the WSPU. Um, so to create a sort of visual image of this tin brooch, um, it reads votes for women on the outside and WSPU on the inside. Um, and WSPU is surrounded by green chain. Um, and as previously mentioned, the chain is a common image in WSPU um, um, artistic production items. Um, it features quite a lot in um, subsequent items of jewellery. So the Sylvia Pankhurst tin badge um, and the Holloway brooch that she also produced also include chains. Um, her tin badge features a woman stepping out from a heavy gate with chains at her feet, whereas the Holloway brooch has chains on the outside. So chains is a common feature um, within the jewellery, which may have started with this tin brooch. Um, it, the words are prioritised over imagery on the brooch, um, suggesting that the direct message it was trying to send was potentially more important than um, its artistic merit. Um, subsequent brooches, such as the two I've just mentioned, um, use quite evocative imagery rather than words. Um, so the um, intention behind their jewellery changed as the campaign went on, but they started with a direct verbal message on the jewellery. Um, it could be that the three colours um, that have been mentioned, the purple, the green and white, became so well associated with WSPU that they didn't need to use words to get their uh, message across or to promote their union. They um, could use um, more powerful imagery and the colours. Um, so to talk a bit about the selling and the, and the um, distribution of the tin brooch, it was produced by the Merchant Portrait Company of uh, Kentish Town. Um, and they, um, this is known because in the uh, newspaper, the, the WSPU's newspaper Votes for Women, uh, they often promoted um, the sale of other brooches and underneath they wrote a little um, caption which said distributors and producers of the um, WSPU badges. Um, they also had a little piece of paper which they put at the back of the tin badge which had their name on it so everyone knew it was them that was producing these badges. Um, it's not considered that there was an allegiance to the union through this um, for this organisation, it was they were just acted as a supplier um, because they also supplied many other um, suffrage organisations with tin badges. Um, so they were obviously just a good creator of tin badges. Um, they were sold, the tin badges, in various different locations. They were sold through Votes for Women shops, specially designated shops to sell suffrage items. 
Um, they were sold at speeches, they were sold at rallies, they were sold by street sellers. Um, and the success of various speeches and talks and rallies could be measured by how many tin badges were sold. So in their newspaper, they often talked about um, a great many badges were sold. Um, we spread the message and a lot of people will be wearing, carrying our message around in these brooches. Um, another suggestion in the newspaper was that um, members buy a multi-pack of tin badges and then sell them on to their friends. So they buy a pack of 12, keep one for themselves and then sell them on. Uh, and the low cost value of the brooch, which I'll go and speak about, uh, meant that this was possible, whereas many of their other badges, such as silver enameled ones, uh, it would have been very difficult for them to buy 12 and then sell them on, whereas the tin badge, it was potentially an achievable thing. Uh, so the multiple channels of distribution that they used for this badge suggested um, that it was a very important part of their campaign using the badges um, because they really focused it on each of their events to make sure that badges were being sold um, and there's many uh, instances of people going on holiday, suffragettes going on holiday and selling badges to people as they go around. So particularly if they're travelling around different parts um, of the UK, they try and spread the WSPU badges around with them. So uh, I want to consider who it was designed for. Um, so it was worn by active members of the union, but also supporters. So it was considered a sign of membership to the cause, um, not necessarily of membership to the union, uh, but maybe support of the union and support for women's suffrage. Um, so as I've mentioned, the cheap material and production costs meant that it could be sold for just a penny. Um, making it one of the very few items that was available, as Claire mentioned, to um, their working class uh, members and supporters, as many of their um, WSP merchandise was aimed at uh, more of a middle class, quite affluent audience. Um, so it, it really um, helped bring in a wider membership and make the union uh, more accessible to a lot of, lot of different people. So it suggests that the production of this tin badge um, points to an active decision by the WSPU leadership to um, widen their base and make themselves seem um, much more um, inclusive by producing this tin badge. Um, speaking of the um, leadership, I've noticed that a um, lot of their, um, the WSP leadership portraits that produce for postcards and promotional items, none of them are ever wearing the tin badge in these um, pictures. Uh, they're more likely to be wearing the Holloway brooch or the Hunger Strike medal, which are brooches that were produced after the tin badge and were awarded rather than being purchased. So it suggests potentially that um, they took more pride in these that were all that were considered medals because they were being awarded for acts of militancy than necessarily they did in a tin badge that they purchased. So um, it could be that the button badge was for supporters and less active or maybe newer members of the union who hadn't yet engaged in um, militant action. So it was almost like the first, the first level of um, WSPU jewellery. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about why it was worn. Um, it linked in with many other aspects of their material culture, which had um, the primary aim of promoting the cause of votes for women. Um, more so than any of their other items, the brooch provided a constant message. By wearing it on the body, um, it was quite a personal message and it could be worn at all times and as the wearer moved about their daily life, they would um, constantly be wearing and moving this message around with them. Um, articles in Votes for Women newspaper stated the importance of wearing the badge at all times, so the WSPU were very um, aware of the importance of or the significance of this badge and how much, um, how, how um, relevant and useful and supportive it could be for their campaign. Um, one woman wrote into the newspaper telling um, other members that she had a badge on every single one of her coats so that she, could, she would never leave the house without one because she believed it was so important. Um, she believed members should get into the habit of wearing it even at home so that it would become almost like a piece of clothing that they would feel naked without. So the constantness of it was a, an integral part of its, um, its um, ability and its use within the campaign. 
Um, it's also been suggested that the three colours, um, purple, white and green, became almost fashionable in their own sense. So they didn't always, um, especially the, the, the early stages of their adoption, um, they weren't always linked directly to the WSPU, whereas the tin brooch, this specific one with the words on it, always links directly back to the Union and um, their fight for women's suffrage. So, um, building on why it was worn, the WSPU cited many reasons for wearing the brooch and for constantly wearing the brooch. Um, they claimed that it could help start conversations with other people if you were wearing it. It would help enlighten people on key campaign points, so um, anything that may be putting people off joining the union could be um, discussed and could be, um, they could maybe persuade new members to join um, by um, highlighting that they were a member themselves. Um, so it could help bring in new members and it could also signal members to each other. So um, if you were at an event, you, could, you would notice, ah, oh, there's some other WSPU members here. Um, another important part of its ability was that it could visually communicate the large support for women's suffrage because um, it was suggested that there wasn't much um, call for women's for the women to have the vote, people didn't want it by but by wearing the brooch it could be seen that a lot of women did support this idea, a lot of men also supported this idea um, and it could almost create a constant large scale support for um, the cause. Diversity women's wearers also helped to dispel the idea that we've already talked about, the suffragettes were um, a band of hooligans to quote the newspaper um, and they suggested the more quiet and unassuming the wearer, the better, and that would be um, even better for dispelling this idea. So going back to the original quote that I um, read out, which is such a little thing everyone can do, I just want to um, discuss whether it was such a little thing that everyone could do. It was obviously a tiny object, but was it such um, an easy thing and a small thing for people to wear it? Um, so an article in Votes for Women said that wearing the WSPU badge invariably attracted attention and they made the wearer very conspicuous. Um, unlike walking in a protest, march um, or being a member of a rally, it was a very individual act of protest. Um, uh, and you may, maybe wearers often felt alone walking down the street wearing this badge. Um, so it required some uh, considerable level of bravery and courage to wear this small brooch. Um, however, feelings of discomfort were um, countered by the union by the suggestion that any member not wearing the badge should maybe feel ashamed when um, so many of their comrades were doing so, so much more courageous things for the cause, um, with many serving time in prison and enjoying force feeding for the cause. So as a militant organisation, um, this was considered um, not, not a um, difficult thing to do. Um, however, one young woman recalled her mother's displeasure when she came home wearing one of these tin badges. Um, she, um, the young woman was also worried that her employer may also take offence and that if she was seen wearing it, she could lose her job. However, rather than remove it, she hid it under the lapel of her coat. And although no one could see it, the knowledge that was there gave her confidence. This woman never actively took part in the suffrage campaign. Um, however, she recalled that owning the brooch uh, made her believe in her abilities in herself um, and gave her um, more confidence. So in this instance, the badge transcended its role with the WSPU and played a wider part in the emancipation of women. Thank you. Oh, it's wonderful to see the variety of publics that get involved with the suffragette cause and the range of objects through which that commitment or that invitation, that provocation, is articulated. As Vegas very elegantly uh, explained to us, there's such a spectrum of ways in which activism can be uh, perpetrated or expressed. And I think a lot of what Katie's going to talk about is the ways in which that had very dramatic life-changing repercussions for many of the suffragette cause members. Uh, to be involved in an action such as putting acid in a post box, smashing windows, slashing a painting like the Rope Be Venus, 
standing in front of the king's horse and sacrificing your own life, inadvertently perhaps, all of these were direct actions that transformed and indeed often shortened the life of members of the suffragette cause. But many were imprisoned, and during that imprisonment, horrific torture was enacted upon them, particularly through force feeding. So I'm really excited to have Katie talk to us about the way in which material culture could continue protest, but also articulate solidarity in those difficult conditions. Thank you. I wanted to explore the idea of an embroidered handkerchief made by a group of suffragettes in Holloway Prison in 1912 as an object with agency, an object that might encourage other women to go on hunger strike. I used three methodologies to do this. Semiotics, which interprets acts, objects and images as signs. Cultural memory theory, which looks at material objects as makers of collective memory an actor network theory, which examines an object within a network of people, things, and social forces. Some of the things I found using semiotics were that third division prisoners, so criminals rather than political prisoners, because I made that distinction in the introduction, were denied pens and paper. But embroidery was allowed because it was considered ladylike. So including the words worked in Holloway prison on the handkerchief was a statement of defiance. The handkerchief has signatures on it, and collecting signatures broke prison rules, so that was an act of rebellion. Signatures also evoke petitions, so that symbolised the political voice. And they mimic, mimic a tradition in which guests embroidered signatures for their hosts after a, a nice stay in somebody's house, so in that way they mocked the women's incarceration. Toffee hammers, the portcullis and the prison dress arrows all appear on the handkerchief. And these are things that also appear on brooches awarded to militant suffragettes, so this can be read as a badge of honour, and the handkerchief can therefore be read as a badge of honour too. So having looked at all the many symbols on the handkerchief, a more nuanced semiotic analysis, allowing for Roland Barthes' motivated relationship between the signifier and the signified, so the, the icons on the handkerchief and what they mean, revealed the transformational power of representation. Torero's handkerchief was made to mean through the signs of the subculture of women's suffrage. And if those in power define the relationship between those signs and what they mean, Torero was reclaiming power. In the second methodology, cultural memory theory, as defined by Marita Sturken, I adapted her perspectives into three, women's work, naming names and ownership. So firstly, I'll look at women's work. As has been mentioned a couple of times now, the suffragettes were a really diverse group of women and working on embroidery, women's work, together helped to unite them. But in calling for the vote, they threatened the very cause they were fighting for. Anti-suffrage campaigners asserted that respectable, respectable women don't want the vote and organised women don't deserve it. Synonymous with chaste and domestic femininity, Torero's skilled needlework positioned her as a dignified woman even while making unwomanly demands. Demonstrating that women could both want and deserve the vote. And finally, the delicateness of her stitch, supposedly proof of her vulnerability as a woman, was in stark contrast to the content that showed her strength and the strength of the other women on hunger strike with her. Embroidery might have been the only tool women had at their disposal in prison, but it was deployed with deft brilliance. The second perspective of naming names comes from cultural memory theory's roots within identity politics and its tenets of proclaiming one's identity and declaring that identity as crucial to one's ability to speak. Signatures and identification of the self, particularly in the context of Victorian autograph collecting and belief in penmanship as character, proclaimed these women's identities so that they might speak. Ownership, my final lens within cultural memory theory, encompasses both author authorship and audience. Despite Jane Torero's credit as the author, the other women's involvement makes this a collective work, and its audience is evolving too, with the Museum of London's Vote for Women exhibition positioning it as part of today's gender equality debate. In a process that Hebdiger calls a magical appropriation of humble objects, Torero had turned a utilitarian handkerchief a length of ribbon and a postcard into an object of testimony, resistance and protest. 
but in what ways did the handkerchief itself have agency? Moving from naming names in cultural memory to listing actors in actor network theory, categorising the actors raised so far into human, object and social, shows the extent to which the semiotic and cultural memory analysis has already started to shift the location of agency from human to non-human actors. Encouraged to embroider because it was a womanly pursuit in contrast to their crimes, the women were in fact creating an object of protest, and therefore the handkerchief shifted the power dynamic and their relationship with their, with their prison guards. The addition of the photograph onto the handkerchief negated its function, which raises the question of purpose. But positioned alongside other badges of honour, it played a similar role. Katie Glidden's prison diary describes her shame at her refusal to go on hunger strike, and that implies an equal and opposite dishonour for those who did not earn such badges of honour. Torero donated the handkerchief to the Suffrage Fellowship in 1927, before their whole collection was gifted to the Museum of London in 1950. As part of the current exhibition, the handkerchief continues to draw attention to women's rights, both then and now, and has inspired contemporary objects such as the Girls Gone Wild zine, a hand-embroidered magazine which promotes radical feminism today. Torero's handkerchief was created as part of a movement that sought not just the vote, but ultimate gender equality. Women's suffrage was partially awarded in 1918 and fully in 1928, but it quickly became apparent that equality had not been achieved. Almost a century later, as hashtags such as MeToo and Time's Up trend on social media in protest against sexual abuse, the fight for equality lives on. So I think we've got a wonderful sense there of both the memory, but also the currency of the debates that we've been looking at. And I think that's a wonderful transition from the way in which a collective craft object created in incarceration also then leads us on to the cultures of medals and memory, which Susan's going to talk to us about now. Yes, I'm talking about the Holloway brooch or the Holloway prison brooch, which is on the front cover of the magazine here that I wrote an article in for the Society of Jewellery Historians. And looking at the article, um, there are two symbols. The arrow symbol, which symbolises prison, and the portcullis, which symbolises parliament. And they're encompassed in the same design, and they sent a powerful message without the use of words, two obvious symbols. The brooch could perhaps be more accurately described as a medal. It was designed by a suffragette, again, Sylvia Pankhurst, to be awarded to other suffragettes, members of the Women's Social and Political Union, who, like Sylvia, had been imprisoned in Holloway Prison for militant deeds in the pursuit of votes and political justice for women. This particular brooch was awarded to Kate Lilly in recognition of her brave action and sacrifice in support of women's suffrage together with her sister Louise. Louise's brooch has broken chain and is also illustrated in my article, The Brooches That Could Not Be Bought in Jewellery History Today. Both brooches were generously given by the Lilly family to the Suffrage Foundation collection and are displayed in the Museum of London, enabling future generations to view and learn from them. The sisters were allocated adjoining cells in Holloway Prison and their sentence for throwing an object through a window at the War Office was two months with hard labour. Most suffragettes targeted shop windows, but these sisters were members of the Lilly and Skinner Shoe Manufacturing Company family, so they perhaps thought it was not an appropriate action in their case. But it was a bold act indeed, as their father was a JP, and they risked being classed and treated as criminals rather than political prisoners. Over 200 women were arrested with the Lilly sisters after the March in nine, after March 1912 demonstrations that coincided with a discussion in Parliament on the Conciliation Bill. All 200 of these women would have been entitled to wear the Holloway brooch following imprisonment. The brooches were awarded at ceremonies designed for maximum propaganda impact. The brooch is made from silver rather than the tin used for the mass-produced union patches as Vegas patch. But the material it was made from shows the importance of its status to the Union. 
It shows the distinctive colours of the Union on the arrow in the translucent enamel that was enjoying a renaissance at the time. Purple for dignity and loyalty to king and cause, white for purity of purpose, and green for a hopeful outcome. Colour was used to great effect by the Union in all their political propaganda materials. The WSPU was a relatively small Union of around 5,000 members. However, it was run and funded by influential men and women, as well as being blessed by gifted artist members. Made by Toy and Company in London, these brooches cost the Union considerably more than the everyday tin badges sold in the shops. They were awards and could not be bought at any price. This brooch, although not produced until 1909, would have been but one of many hundreds required, according to the National Archives Roll of Honour of Suffragette Prisoners, 1905-1914. It lists a thousand female prisoners and around 40 male prisoners, Alfred Abbey being the first name on the list, a male. Not all these, of course, were WSBU members. Bringing this object of material culture into today's arena is the adoption of a brooch based on Sylvia Pankhurst's design made for Baroness Boothroyd, the first and as yet the only female speaker of the House of Commons this country has had. She wore her brooch, incorporating the portcullis, but not of course the arrow, on her parliamentary ceremonial regalia during her governmental duties and still wears it today in her private life. She states, and this brings the relevance of this object as a political tool into this century. For the last 30 years, I've worn a brooch I had made similar to that designed by Sylvia and presented to suffragette prisoners in 1909. Its main theme is the portcullis encased in chains. To me, it is a reminder of the gates of a prison where Sylvia was taken 13 times for her suffrage militancy. It also reminds me of the symbol of the Houses of Parliament, where I'm privileged to sit as a member as a result of her foresight, her sacrifices and her legacy. Well, I think you can understand why I'm so immensely proud of the students on our programme in the History of Design and these key members of Kellogg College. This is an indication of how much research they are undertaking, but how much more there is still to do. The Women's History Library has a unique archive of interviews made by Sir Brian Harrison of the suffragettes in the 70s, describing their experiences, exploring the ways in which these kinds of objects operate. The Museum of London has a unique collection of the material culture of suffragette activism and dissent. But more importantly, our current study body at Oxford has wonderful women studying, garnering the degrees that were denied them at the point of these acts of intervention, risking their lives in the case of one student better known as Malalia to many of us today. To learn, to communicate, to educate, to express the ways in which ordinary scarves as well as the wearing and adopting of shared colours of every part of the rainbow is a lot of what I hope we've celebrated today. So thank you all for all your interventions and I trust that this demonstrates how much the research into the everyday object, the hallmarks of memory, are so much of what we do here at Kellogg but also in the history of design.